everybody. Yes, thank you for uh, tuning in and I'm really looking forward to chatting with you all and hope that you do manage to put some questions in because, you know, the de today's topic itself is actually a question in itself, isn't it? So, you know, we're really thinking about what is autism and how we can actually um, answer that question and what that um, looks like in reality for um, all of us, really. And I'm thinking, um, I've not gone too technical because, and I haven't um, put in a lot of information that you can access on the internet because you're as capable of doing that as me, but I've certainly got some pointers in here. And, um, you know, it might be you've got a family member um, that's sort of a bit um, questioning and not quite understanding what autism is. So, you know, the With Us Like um, group is always a, a fabulous group to work with and they've got all the um, points of information and, you know, this is going to be on there. So you can always share that with family members. And if they are saying, well, what is autism? Then, you know, hopefully um, after our hour together today, you'll be able to um, answer that with some clarity. And I know when um, I got asked the question, well, what is autism? I kind of um, could go down the very uh, quick succinct line of, well, you know, it's a neuro neurodevelopmental difference in the way that we interact, interpret and behave. Um, but actually that sort of sums it up a little bit too neatly because of course it's not quite so neat. And if we think about um, where is autism in terms of today, in terms of 2023, then it's a good idea to just glance backwards a little bit. So this was my sort of response that I came up with. So what is autism? It is a historically acknowledged difference in interaction, communication, processing and responding. It's medically defined and diagnosed and it may be explained by genetic, neonatal, prenatal experience, the environment, um, links which could include um, antibodies, proteins, contaminants, environmental exposure. And it's supported, and I think that's an important um, route to go down. It's supported by understanding knowledgeable and also environmental adaptations and that sort of sensitive and appropriate timely coaching. So that's kind of my definition that I came up with and I was thinking well what gives me the right to come up with that? I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a doctor um, but I, I think um, apart from uh, all the research papers and the theory and uh, the uh, assessment articles that I've read and the publications and documents that I've read and accessed over um, sort of my lifetime of, of study and also work experience. But if I'm honest, I think these are the things that have really influenced my kind of answering this question of what is autism. They've influenced my beliefs, they've developed my understanding and they've enriched my autism and neurodiverse experiences. And I'd have a big family um, picture of my adorable family up there too if this wasn't on the World Wide Web because they too have shaped my understanding and my knowledge. And I'm sure that's the same for you. And as you can see from this slide, my journey has been very much through organizations through a professional journey of working with supporting and um, encouraging families and other professionals and learning from them along the way and I've had such a massive privilege throughout my career to have met families from all of these countries with autistic children and to have worked with professionals in all of these countries some very briefly but enough certainly momentarily to really kind of remind me of the fact that actually this journey, um, the diagnosis of this journey may have changed, the terminology may have changed, but actually the fundamental experience for um, an autistic person really hasn't um, changed that much, just our understanding and our terminology. So where was it rooted? Well, of course, when we look back on history, 
and we think about research and knowledge and experience, then the interesting thing is that actually autism in its essence was mentioned way back in 1911 by Eugen Bleuer. And he actually um, documented autism and the uh, presentations of that as um, sort of schizophrenia and uh, talked of sort of self-absorption and that um, very isolated sort of way of uh, interacting and coping with the world, which of course we understand much more fully these days and we'll have a brief look at that momentarily. But if you think about um, evolvement and evolution in terms of our understanding, then we're not all walking around in the same clothes that we wore in the early 1900s. You know, our fashions changed. And why has that changed? Well, probably because we learned that actually through our lifestyles changing and the demands of the world changing, then the way that we dressed in the 1900s wasn't perhaps so practical or wasn't um, quite so uh, helpful in terms of what we want to achieve and what we want to accomplish in today's world. So it's the same really for autism. It's evolved massively through that um, familiarity, through exposure and through sort of reference of, well, what does it really mean and what is the real impact? And if we think about um, the NICE guidelines, which only were originally established in 1999. They really um, are helpful pointers for understanding um, our journey and understanding the evolution of autism, along with, of course, the World Health Organization. So we've got some really helpful um, information going on here. And of course, some of that information Whilst helpful in terms of supporting us on our understanding of what is autism, it also can be a little bit um, heart-tugging to read the language that's used in many of these um, guidelines and many of these pointers that our psychologists and our assessors do use. And I think that's because terminology seems to be taking much longer in the evolutionary journey than even our understanding. Our understanding is massively greater now than it was even five, ten years ago. And yet we're still using um, words like persistent deficits. And I think sometimes there's a danger that um, we can get very sort of pulled down with that. And I think um, as time goes on, we're really understanding these better as differences, and maybe we will see the terminology change. But for now, this is what we're faced with. So in the, um, the DSM-5, which is the um, diagnostic uh, manual for diseases, and it gets updated every so many years, which is really great. And the last time it was updated um, was in 2013, when it talked about persistent deficits in social communication, social interaction across all of the following currently or by history. So deficits in social emotional reciprocity, ranging from abnormal social reports and failure of normal back and forth conversation and then restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior and symptoms that must be present in early development. And they may not manifest until social demand exceeds limited capacities or may be masked by learning strategies in later life. So what is that really about? And that's what we're going to just have a brief look at because that whole um, deficit and the the meaning of that gives us a feeling of failure, really. And whilst assessments are all still score points and based um, in observation, then there's a danger that we continue to measure as failure to meet those criteria. And that when we're 
meeting criteria that's got an expected number or an expected outcome, then um, we can't kind of get up there to that point. Then actually the whole measure, the whole emphasis is looking at failure. So hopefully in time um, that will change and I think there's a lot of influencers out there that are campaigning and working hard to look at how that can change. And I think when we, um, you know, look at the other uh, diagnostic um, books and, and um, materials, so the autism uh, diagnosis criteria and the ICD-11, the identification and um, classification diseases, then that again um, is really kind of looking at uh, that deficit of um, behaviours and interactions and social communication. And we know that this is founded in our uh, brains and our research and the fact that um, we know that everything psychological is biological. And so when we think about the way in which those connections are making sense. So that neurological sort of um, connection is very evident in our understanding nowadays, which wasn't the case. And when we think about the research that, that's been done, then often we can um, look at, at recent research that's not always just autism specific, but it gives us a nice pointer as to what's going on. And, Martha Corvelt, she specialises in curriculum development and she discusses the fact that actually many of our um, dendrites and neurons are helping us in making those sort of aha moments, those connections. And it's a bit like, you know, if we stop texting a friend then we stop getting messages back. And that's about that sort of interaction. It's all about the action and the responses and the reactions and how we can um, sort of help to understand those in our chemical makeup. And if we can understand that and understand that actually often these are very involuntary reactions and that the control of them is what we need to be thinking about teaching and supporting our children in. And so I just think just to connect with that thought a minute, let's just think of an occasion when you have felt like reacting in a certain way. And then let's think why we didn't. And if you want to just pop that in the chat, that would be great because we can pick up on those and have a think about how what the relevance is and what it is about autism that actually gives us lots of those perhaps involuntary um, reactions or, or we witness those sometimes involuntary um, responses from our children. And it's about how can we teach them to um, understand those better and how can we teach that regulation of those as well. So I think the fact that we know now that our chemical brain is all part of that, um, what is autism, that it's, uh, basically writing letters and making text messages for us, which is why we can connect with memories that we know about Halloween. We know kind of the sorts of things that perhaps might happen. So we're working on um, understanding that actually the excitements that we feel are um, psychologically triggered, but biologically um, experienced. And so, all of those sit differently for autis autistic people too. So another area that's different for autistic people and that research is telling us is about our structural brain. And the fact that actually for many autistic brains, there are physical differences, um, just like there might be response differences for those chemical brains, there are physical differences in our structural brain. So research is really um, informing us about the reality and the physicality of autism and, and what that experience is. And differences in the lobe structures, in the cortex of our brains and in the amygdala, the kind of fight or flight or freeze um, 
indicator. So there's a lot of research going on that tells us that actually those different structures, those different ways of processing, that different function and interaction will all impact on the way in which we observe our children who are on that autistic spectrum. And I think if we think about our children, we don't think, um, you know, look at this little picture and we think, you know, how do we know a child has um, autism? It's not that they don't play, it's how they play that matters. And this little park scene can sort of remind us that, that actually when our hearts and minds are focused on these particular um, activities, then we can really um, sometimes miss the fact that actually our children are perhaps playing and giving us those clues in a very different way to that of their peers. And that's because of all of this um, research that we are um, seeing and experiencing and that's really influencing our understanding it's moved us from those early 1900 beliefs to today's understanding of autism the fact that it's very much and um, very entrenched in our brain development our brain reaction our brain responses our brain functions and when we think about the way in which our brain functions then we're also considering all of the um, different responses, the way in which we recognize people, even recognizing um, faces and facial expressions. I'm working with um, a young lady at the moment and that's an area that she really does struggle. And sometimes I'll be trying to just kind of work out what she's saying and she'll say, why are you cross with me? And I say, I'm absolutely not cross with you on this is my curious face this is my listening face and it's very difficult sometimes for um, our autistic community to really interpret all of those faces and if you just look at these few examples here apart from everything else that's going on around the face we're then expecting our um, children to actually interpret that with ease and of course um, lots of young children do learn very quickly about facial expression they're able to respond to that quite quickly and one of the things on um, the mchat test uh, which is the 16 to uh, 30 months um, questionnaire that happens nowadays to help with this early screening one of the questions on there is around can our children um, understand our face do they look at us when we smile do they smile back do they respond to some of those facial um, expressions so even very early on our children are starting to use facial expressions to inform them of the situation to inform them of um, a communication that's happening and i think when we think about um experiences you know i've had um experiences at school where perhaps just as i say a face is misinterpreted or maybe something very simple like your hair might change color or shape or style and then that throws off and um, sometimes autistic children's recognition of um, what's going on and tony atwood comments um in his books about the fact that um you know it can be very difficult for uh, autistic children to accept change and to cope with um understanding that actually that's still sort of the same person that it's not the person that's changed it's really just those um facial expressions and perhaps the, that changes the social context of what's going on as well and i know Uita Frith uh, another psychologist she talks about the different styles of thinking and processing and what it really amounts to is that actually our brains matter and our brain developments matter and psychologists have been observing for decades now and recording this process of how um, young children develop and that early indication 
of differences in development. And the reason I'm mentioning young children, even though you may be listening as an adult trying to answer the question, what is autism? Is that autism doesn't just happen um, in our 30s, 40s, 50s, or in our teens. It's there all the time. But sometimes people have not realized that they are perhaps um, experiencing feelings or behaving differently to that of their peers. Or they may have learned to um, sort of mask and, and work with who they are or how they are in a way that's not got in the way, in a way that has been okay and has been acceptable. But there are set criteria in those social and sensory differences and responsive um, reactions. And many other characters that psychologists have mentioned and I've mentioned and alluded to over training over the years. And they're often, um, you know, the fact that um, they're shared with our very dedicated professionals and our personal experiences. And that's led all led to a greater understanding in the differences of many other areas of autism, like executive functioning, theory of mind, that central coherence theory, and even um, new information coming out all the time. You know, um, things like misophonia, where we're looking very specifically at some of the sensory reactions around sound, perhaps around coping with other people's um, body noises and those elements. So all the time, new information is coming to our forefront. And of course, all of this forms part of that bigger picture. And I think, you know, it leads us to think about, you know, what is the shared experience? And if that shared experience is tied up, as we've said already, in our brain development, in the way that we are interacting socially, that we are communicating, that our sensory system is interpreting information for us. And therefore, we're seeing some very different ways of interacting and behaving. And I love that Carol Gray recently talked about the fact that rather than uh, thinking of the word behavior, it's really helpful to think of it in terms of reactions and responses, because that opens our heart and opens our mind to being more um, considered in how we interpret those and therefore how we support and coach those um, reactions and responses, rather than it just being labeled a behavior and sort of closing things down from there. So all of this information, of course, leads us to the point of a diagnosis. And the diagnosis, as we know um, in today's world, whilst um, NHS England uh, comments on the autism assessment pathways should take no longer than three months for a referral. But actually, for many, many people, 86% in actual fact documented in March 2023 are experiencing a much longer waiting time. And so I think it's really important that we don't just sit back and um, think about um, what can we do, that actually we progress as best we can with our diagnosis, but then we also think in terms of what does that look like and how can we move on? So let's just have a look at getting to this point of referral for assessment. So we've now established that our child's brain is perhaps functioning differently. It have, we're having seen lots of different um, sort of immediate reactions, those very quick reactions. We may be seeing some different responses. We're seeing differences in interpretation of communication, in understanding, in interaction. And maybe our alarm bells are ringing. And so what do we do now? So now we need to think about gathering that information and seeking um, a professional to help us to sort of collate that and put that together. 
So a GP referral or maybe your health visitor. And as I mentioned already, that MCHAT document all help to sort of build up that bigger picture. And because autism is still um, assessed with this bigger picture, we don't have one test um, as yet. I, I would love and hope that um, eventually that will uh, come and um, things will have more clarity. Then I think that will be um, a massive shift forward for the um, autistic world. And so at the moment, once all these assessments are in place, and we've perhaps been exposed to the autism pathway, which ideally has five stages. One is to do the identification, which we've talked about, and then the referral. And then the second stage is about that sort of screening and, and uh, the triage, so that gathering of information from other people. So keeping a diary, making a record, those sorts of things are really, really important. And then we're going to have that um, sort of hopefully access to some pre-assessment support. And arguably, I think that MCHAT sort of is a, a kind of pathway into that. But then that can look very different in everybody's different um, authority and experience, unfortunately. And then it will be for an ADSD assessment by a team of professionals who might use a diagnostic tool um, like perhaps DISCO, which is the Diagnostic Interview for Social and Communication Disorders, or they may be using the ADOS, which is another um, autism diagnostic observation schedule. But again, as you can see, these are all done by sort of assessment. And so that big picture is really important. And so once that assessment is underway, then it may be that um, we are given an actual sort of um, diagnosis of mild, moderate or severe um, autism. And I think um, lots of psychologists attempt to sort of move away from that or, or stay clear from that because, of course, actually severity is um, subjective. And whilst you may appear to have mild autism in one scenario, it may actually be quite severe if you're plucked from that familiar environment and, and expected to cope somewhere else with something else, you might see a big shift. So those terms are really more about defining external support. So we might have a mild diagnosis that people say, oh, they need a little bit of support, but then moderate would indicate that there is substantial support required and severe, very substantial support. And so that's meaning on a daily basis. So when we are considering um, getting that information together, then it's a good idea to think, what would be a typical experience for a child of this particular age? And I, I never like to draw those comparisons because I absolutely value and embrace and love the fact that our children are different. Who wants to be the same as everybody else? And every autistic child is completely unique and completely different. But in this particular instance, for drawing that big picture when you are seeking assessment, then that is a really helpful thing to do to kind of just have some level, or some um, measure against that. And all the diagnostic assessment should hopefully then be used to tailor what support and intervention may be required. And I know I'm, I'm massively aware because I work with families very regularly. I'm very aware that that actually doesn't happen consistently or regularly for everybody. So please don't feel that sitting in an ivory tower here um, talking about assessments and, um, and then eventually um, education, health and care plans, if they're appropriate for our children, then I understand that that is um, for many a very difficult pathway. But the kind of writings on the wall in terms of what we should be seeing. And this is what we should be seeing. So we should be seeing specific interventions for core features of autism. And these are the nice guidelines. These are the recent 
guidelines from NICE. And as you can see here, they're talking about play-based interventions and um, efforts to increase joint attention and engagement, all those reciprocal communication points that we've um, already touched on when we've looked at the chemical, functional and the structural brain, those reactions and responses. And that strategies should really be used to um, adjust and help with development. So we're thinking about tailoring um, support. We're thinking about how can that be put into place appropriately for that child's developmental level. And these are for, this is for all children. This is what should be happening in terms of home life, school life. These are guidelines that really should be um, being adhered to. And so another one, the aim to increase the parents, the teachers, peers, anybody else working with, understanding, living with, the understanding and the sensitivity and the responsiveness to that child's patterns of behavior, communication and interaction. So the actual NICE guidelines are telling us that we really should be concentrating on those areas that are marked in the um, diagnostic criteria as, I know it's that D word, but as deficit. So that's where we should be pouring our energies. And I know from families I work with that often they complain that actually that's not where the energies are being poured in terms of support and help. And so I think it's important that, you know, we're aware of these documents, we're aware of these guidelines, because these are something that we can use to help us draw that big picture to answer what is autism, but also to help us in terms of moving forwards and helping with um, getting the right support, getting the right intervention in place for um, our children and answering um, to other people that whole question of what is autism. And you're not going to go into this detail when someone asks you that question, but you are going to hopefully be able to say that it is um, a documented, historically understood um, element of brain development, the way that the brain reacts, the way that we function, and the way that we understand the world and interpret the world, and that that happens right from the word go. It's not something that just occurs. And here we've got some sort of highlighted in red, some guidelines there for not using uh, for um, treatment um, or intervention of autism. And so I think it's inevitable that when we are um, thinking about what is autism and we're thinking um, how do we reach that diagnostic point, that we do then um, sort of take a, a quick glance at those guidelines because they can be a helpful benchmark in this process. But I think um, other helpful benchmarks in this process and I certainly feel um, quite proud, really, that actually, whilst working at the National Autistic Society, then I was um, exposed and able to access a huge amount of um, training and uh, experience. And I think one thing we always did, and I'm sure still happens now, is we really sort of strived while developing and delivering training and I certainly strive to do that now, to um, work consistently to achieve these guidelines. You know, that's kind of the premise where really we should all still um, be working from. And I think working consistently um, to access the right information, the safe information. Autism has been around now for a longer time. It's been understood but on varying levels, in varying ways, and still by um, a variety of different um, organisations and bodies and interventions and claims. And I think, um, you know, you only have to Google autism 
uh, what is autism to get a whole rake of and a whole range of answers and some uh, not so accurate than others and actually some guidelines and some pointers not so helpful as others either and I think um, what is important and what I've put up here for us are some areas of training that actually even as a parent you can access you know there's no reason for you not to look into these things as I said you know those sands of times ticked by and so you know you may be on that very first part of your journey and so gathering all this information is really important but also being empowered to think about well what can you move forward on to and all of these things have parent courses so PEX is that really um, intensive support in communication and not just for pre-verbal children so perhaps our children that aren't using our language as their language as yet and so do benefit from really connecting from a visual reminder of what we're saying and what we're seeing can be really helpful for our children but actually it can be really helpful for our teenagers and our adults and we just sort of change the way that we do that and so making sure that the supports that we put in place have real meaning and are founded in good solid research and are evidence to practice and so PECS picture exchange communication system certainly ticks all those boxes I did my PEX training many, many years ago and still draw massively on the value of that. And the same for Carol Gray's social story. She's just done a 10.4 update, which I've just accessed. And she's got some really fabulous supportive ways of helping reveal the social situation for our children and help them to navigate through those very challenging social arenas that we've just talked about as part of autism and she's done a fabulous um social story recently on carol gray's club called um diagnosis and she really kind of uh, supports the concept that actually everyone gets a diagnosis of something at some time and that it can be really helpful in terms of accessing information and help and support and um treatment if um, it's a diagnosis of uh, something that's treatable and she kind of you know makes that connection uh, very real for um, our children in that story so thinking about um, you know diagnosis in the bigger picture of other things really normalizes the fact that you know you might have a diagnosis of x y or z so it's really worth having a look at that and then um, Division Teach, which is um, very much um, uh, entrenched in all of that information, um, just as this beautiful picture here actually demonstrates so nicely around schedules, around um, following sort of diaries and calendars, that kind of approach. But again, something that we can update and keep appropriate for each of our children here's a little boy here and you can see how just engrossed and how helpful he knows that strategy is for him he's fully engrossed he's using that independently and he's using that to help him to navigate his way around his morning and if you think about the things that we've touched on that whole social communication that social interaction all of these um, executive functioning, all of these kinds of strategies really tap into the skills that are needed for achieving all of those things. So it's a very positive way to support our child's autistic um, brain and autistic pattern of thinking. And um, on the autism website, the National Autistic Society website, there's lots of information on positive behaviour, on strategies and interaction. And depending where you are on your journey as to sort of where you are feeling it would be right to reach out, then please use those um, 
areas of information, they're safe and uh, they're worth certainly um, visiting. And of course, all of these things add up to the fact that actually nothing is categoric. And so I think um, it's really worth just reminding ourselves that actually even autism forms part of this bigger picture. It forms part of this neurodiverse picture. And you can see there some of the other labels that we um, pop into that um, neurodiverse umbrella. And as we've heard this morning, each one of those really warrants a greater and a deeper understanding. But it's also undeniable that there are uh, commonalities amongst all of them. And as um, you know, we've commented here, the most reliable way to sort of forecast the future is to understand the present. And um, certainly John Nesby, who is the author of um, the most exciting breakout breakthroughs, sorry, observed that the most exciting breakthroughs of the 21st century won't occur because of all the technology and all the screening and all of those things, but because of us really expanding our understanding of the fact that actually autism, neurodiversity, many, many of these different neurodiverse ways of understanding, interpreting, responding, reacting, interacting with the world is part of that bigger picture of um, neurodevelopment and part of that um, and the concept of that I think helps us to have a more positive approach and a more realistic understanding. The fact that um, you know we're talking about being unique and each individual child has that uniqueness and so there is good reason that um, autism is part of this wider picture and described as a spectrum and it's important that we appreciate that there's no one size fits all and the elements of autism that we have barely really touched on this morning are really just like a little pipette of colour into a massive whole pool of water and actually these all form part of what is increasingly understood as neurodiversity and because not only do we experience um, sort of consistent and continual shifts in that autism spectrum, we also have a greater understanding of um, the experiences of these coexisting differences. And so I think, you know, as, as time goes on and um, psychologists that we've mentioned, like Tony Atwood and Rita Frith and Gary Mezibov and many, many other um, gurus and Simon Baron Cohen in the field of um, autism continue with their work and um, continue to drive research forwards then I think then we will um, continue hopefully to think about um, this bigger picture of autism and part of um, our journey of understanding but actually the most important thing to um, answer those, uh, that question of what is autism is to commit to the fact that actually we want to really just understand things so that we can help our children to retain their sparkle, to be their best selves and to shine for the world as their best selves. And yes, we've touched on the history of autism. Yes, we understand hopefully a little bit more of the context and some of the definitions that we've, we've looked at that form part of that assessment pathway. We've just touched on diagnosis and um, how we go about a seeker diagnosis. And we've dipped our toe in the water for some of the research, some of the um, established psychologists in the field of autism, of which there are many, many more that I haven't mentioned or time to mention today. And then also thinking in terms of how can we seek the right kind of support? And depending where you are on your journey, you may want to just reach out to someone 
like myself who, who's independent, you might want to go onto the National Autistic Society website and look at some of their services and some of um, the support that they offer. But what you shouldn't be doing is feeling that you're out there um, with your child whose sparkle is being left to sort of burn to a, to a quiver. So um, hopefully a, a kind of topical uh, thought for this time of year to just be aware of um, how important it is to maintain our child's sparkle in order that um, we can maintain our own as well. And I hope that has just helped answer uh, the question, what is autism? It's a different way of shining for the world. So I don't know if we've got any questions or any comments in the chat that we want to just um, pick up with for the last 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you, Amory. We've had quite a few coming in. Uh, the first one is, when my child smells certain smells or see bobbles on clothes, she gags as if to vomit uh, do, and does everything to try to get away from or turn away from this, the thing. Why is that? I think from what you're saying, that sounds like a, a really strong sensory response. So very often our autistic children have what we call hyper or hypo sensory systems. So if you're hyper sensory um, to some things, which does not mean to say you'll be hypersensitive to everything, then it can be that um, she's having some really hyper sensory responses. And that actually what seems just like a bobbly jumper um, to you, or seems like just a little smell, um, a, 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 kind of mild smell to you or maybe a smell that you don't even pick up on at all that is so strong for your child that it's actually triggering a physical reaction and so and um, that and um, you know inhaling that smell is enough to create that physical response of um, needing to vomit and one of the ways we can help with that is to mask that so you know maybe put in some pleasant smell that she she you might may find that she seeks out certain smells so perhaps perfume um or a certain uh, maybe um wash powder that you use and making sure that um she's got a kind of you know area of that that she could smell instead to help to sort of mask when that um, situation arises. I know I've had to um, have children who have had a little scarf on or had a, a piece of cloth or a little flannel in their pocket that they can pull out and, and sniff to get through a supermarket or to get through a department store because they can't um, deal with some of the sensory smells that are hitting them. So not unusual at all. Brilliant, thank you. We've actually had a question from a professional. It's a good question. Any thoughts on professionals who may act as gatekeepers to referral for diagnosis slash support because the child's autistic presentation is internalised and they deem it is not significant enough to get support? I think, you see, my thoughts on this are if um, someone is asking for support, then it seems immoral not to give it. Um, and maybe it's finding the right pathway of support and the right people to support in that situation. I'm not kind of that clear of the question really, but um, I mean, you can certainly pop me an email and um, you know, if there's anything that we can uh, liaise and, and help, I can help with in terms of um, accessing support, then please do make contact. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, next one is, my son struggles with social retail situations. Is there anything we can do to assist him, please? Social retail? Uh, yeah, social retail situations. Okay, um, again, I'm not, I'm not sure social retail, that's not an, um, a term that I've heard uh, before, but I'm imagining social um, experiences. And so um, one of the ways or one of the strategies that can be really, really helpful in terms of understanding a social situation 
is to turn to using um, Carol Gray's social stories, but they're a very specific approach and it's really important that they are um, put together properly and appropriately. So um, have a look on Carol Gray's website and also um, make contact if you want me to help you put a social story together for a certain social situation. But I think apart from that, what the social story does, and that's what we can do in essence, is be very clear and be very real on teaching a social situation. And I always say one of the ways we can do that is to think, take a step back and pretend that you are landing in that situation as an alien from another planet. And so whatever you would just understand about a given social situation, we very often, they are the elements that we need to teach our children. So for example, we just know when we go in a library, we don't do all the running around and the climbing on bookshelves and shouting and making a big noise. We just know that that's the social expectation. But of course, for our children, even into quite older ages, they don't just know that. And sometimes families will say, well, I told him last time or last week when we went, but I worked with a gentleman for many, many years. And he used to say to me that every day in the office was like his first day at work. And that was because just anything tiny might have moved or changed, or there might be a different smell or something you know, that we didn't even notice was enough to make him feel uncomfortable and new and, and not so familiar. And so, you know, if that's the case for someone working in the same place day in, day out, then it's not surprising that for many of our children, visiting a library once a week is not enough information for them to retain the social rule book around that. And so we need to be very conscious about how we are revealing that and how um, we are ensuring that we're setting um, our children up to enjoy that experience and to have the social understanding around it. Brilliant, thanks Anne-Marie. Uh, the next one is, I'm a mum of three boys and suspected my six-year-old has autism. Thank you so much for putting this information so simple. Do you have any advice to help my other two boys understand that I'm not favouriting our youngest by letting him get away with things that they can't? I do lots, probably not enough for um, the time here, but um, absolutely, and again, totally not uncommon. And I, I think there's a misconception around um, fairness uh, for our children. And I think it's very common, and um, I'm mum of three boys as well, so completely get it. Uh, and um, I think it's important, first of all, to teach that actually fairness is not about treating everybody in exactly the same way. That's not what fairness is about. Fairness is about dealing with the situation in a way that's right for that person, for that individual. And so if you can kind of point out where you do things differently in order to make life pleasant. So for example, they're probably not all playing the same PlayStation game because they like different things for different age ranges and they might have preferences of food and so you're not giving them all exactly the same all of the time and so if you can really start to highlight those moments that actually it's not about fairness it's about dealing with um, your six-year-old in the way that is best for him and that you deal with the other boys in the way that's best for them and that's a parent's job and um, it, I think that just dissolves some of this sort of comparing all the time and um, there's lots more that we could say and there's lots of strategies uh, that can be really helpful as well so um, I'm sure we've we've done some um, work before for with a slack I've done some work for with a slack on um, supporting strategies and so there's some webinars on the um, forum that you'll be able to access. But also, again, if um, you know you want to reach out individually, then I'm happy um, for that contact. 
but also um, have a look on the autism um, NAS website as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Uh, next one is, why and when does regression happen? Interested in learning more about how it presents in a very young autistic child. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I've heard this before and actually way, way back when I worked in the National Autistic Society. Um, and I worked with a, a lovely speech and language therapist and um, who was uh, very um, instrumental in developing the early bird programs. Um, and she always used to say, um, Jane, she used to say, um, it's almost sometimes as if we feel as if our children were kind of rooted in a um, certain situation in a certain way and developing in a certain way. And then we saw a shift of development. And, and as you say, sometimes people call that regression. I think it's probably better understood as a reaction or a response or a change. And I think the change can be actually more in what we are noticing about that child. And sometimes that, um, you know, when we looked at that brain structure and we looked at some of that natural pruning that happens during development, then sometimes um, the pruning is happening differently for um, our children. And so we're seeing some of these developmental changes um, as well. And um, I don't, I'm not aware of uh, any kind of one categoric answer for that question but I think it's certainly to do with developmental um, progression and also that um, natural pruning that happens during development where you know we forget um, skills from being very early on in development to now you know um, all those reflexes that we have at birth we lose over time and it's the same for development and so I think um, there's not a one answer, there's not a categoric answer, but it, it's certainly something that is talked about within um, our world of autism, these kind of apparent regressions. And I think, um, again, it's about supporting them as best we possibly can through, um, you know, back to that um, point that they had already got to. And of course, it happens with typically developing children as well. In some ways, you know, parents talk about often a regression in toilet training, for example, when a new baby comes along. And so, you know, sometimes it's about us also being very aware of the environmental influences and looking at, at very, very much digging down, trying to understand the reasons why that um, regression may have occurred and not just putting it down to sort of a developmental pruning or anything like that. So I think looking really deeply is probably the best answer. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Um, next one is, can you offer help in acquiring EHCP for my son? A school have failed to apply despite numerous outside agencies identifying his difficulties and said he needs one. Yeah, um, you can actually start an EHCP, Education, Health and Care Plan process um, yourself, you can request one, but um, you do need kind of a, a pathway into that and this is often the problem. And so I would um, definitely recommend that you take an appointment with your GP to discuss that and to discuss the fact that the Education, Health and Care Plan isn't progressing and you feel that um, it's something from your home perspective that you want to pursue. Because I think sometimes we make a mistake in thinking that if school aren't progressing with an education health and care plan, that we can't. And actually, for sometimes for our children, it may be that school feel they can't because they're not experiencing enough evidence that actually much of the evidence is being experienced at home. And, you know, in fairness to school, that is a, a, a bit of a, a quandary for them because they're not, not necessarily, it's not that they don't believe parents. And sometimes I think we worry that that is the case, but it, it can be that they actually genuinely are perhaps seeing this child who, you know, may be masking, but actually is um, presenting uh, academically able and apparently 
seems to be sort of coping well at school and often we get the kind of aftermath um, at home. So you absolutely can pursue one and, and via your GP is a good place to start. 